So yeah, I've split my presentation into three parts. A very quick whistle-stop tour of the science of well-being, followed by um, rumination, if you like, on the question, can urban design make a real difference? Um, and I've broken that down into two parts. First of all, understanding what works, and then the effective translation of that into, into practice. Um, and I have one slide of uh, concluding thoughts. So, so this is the... Um, have the sli slides changed a bit? Are they, are the slides changed, moved up? Okay, no, no worries. I'll, I'll press on. I think um, they're going to be right. Um, so, this uh, a lot of my, the research I'm doing is is predicated in this this diagram, this uh, work. Uh, the idea that for general populations, there, there, are, there are exceptions, you know, bipolar, schizophrenia, but for the general population, by and large, we operate on a single spectrum in terms of our mental health. At one end, we have mental disorders, especially common mental disorders, so Anxiety, depression, um, uh, going along from there, languishing. We have uh, people who don't necessarily fulfill a clinical diagnosis, but nonetheless, they experience uh, one or two of the symptoms day to day, and it affects their day to day living. Um, then, moving along from there, we have people um, in the middle, and this is the vast bulk of the population because it's thought to be a normally, di normally distributed phenomenon. Um, basically, they have average or uh, moder moderately good mental health. And the top end there, we have people who are flourishing. They're, they're feeling really good and they're functioning really effectively. It's a combination of hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. Um, and basically, uh, so far, there's all sorts of reasons to show, well, fundamentally, we know it's good, uh, but there are also some scientific reasons. Um, for instance, it's associated with idea generation, memory function, tolerance of others, uh, improve, improved immune function. Uh, so lots of reasons why flourishing is really very good. Um, and the idea is that through uh, intervention, we might uh, shunt, if you like, this spectrum across, we skew it towards a higher prevalence of flourishing in the general population. Um, so yeah, the idea is because it's normally distributed, um, if we can shunt it over a little bit, we can make a difference for, for a very large number of people. And so really quickly, if we're going to intervene effectively, what are the causes? Um, this is a very, very quick um, overview. Uh, this, this is debate has been dominated by behavioral gen geneticists, especially, um, and they, they've said for a long time, essentially, it's like a set point. Um, you, you either win a genetic lottery and you're born with a high set point, which, which you, uh, you average around, uh, and you're either lucky or you're not. Actually, it's, it's turning out to be more of a, a set range, whereby it's, um, you, we have actually quite a bit of scope to lift ourselves to the top of that range. Um, so there is a genetic component, but um, there's a lot to be said for the thoughts and behaviours that we choose to take um, day to day. So just by way of example, uh, I've been looking especially at the five ways to well-being, um, and uh, they are, um, well back in well, 2008, NEF uh, uh, summarised this, but since then there's been more and more evidence uh, to show that these are five of the key drivers, behavioural drivers for sustained positive mental health. So connecting with others could be with family, friends, strangers, um, being active, physically active, taking notice. That's essentially mindfulness or, or quite close to meditation. You don't have to do it upside down. Um, it's the monks that are keep, keep learning, continue learning through life uh, and giving, being altruistic. That's going even like, beyond connecting with people. And so can design make a real difference for, for, uh, for flourishing? Uh, I'm going to... If that, yeah, that was like a whistle stop tour of uh, well, well-being and the science of well-being. Can design make a real difference? So I've got two, two key uh, points. Uh, first of all, we need to understand what works. And then, as I said before, if we need to effectively translate that into practice. So, um, okay, so first point. Yeah, so we need to avoid what uh, I refer to as candy floss. Um, oh, I don't, I don't refer, sorry. Um, this is something, this is a, a criticism that's plagued well-being for two or three decades. Um, the, the idea that uh, well-being is, um, it's all very sweet, but it's not much, there's not much substance there, not, not enough substance there. Uh, and so as designers, I, I, I think, and it, within the built environment, I think that's kind of where we're at at the moment. The enthusiasm is way, way ahead of the evidence. Um, and there's two things. We, we, need, we, we, really, we need to reach beyond this um, aspiration, this intuition, this assertion. Um, and we need two things, positive measures, uh, robust positive measures, incredible research. So 
On the first one, in terms of positive measures, I, I, like, I like to quote uh, Sir Gus O'Donnell, um, who, who says, if we treasure it, measure it. Um, so by this, I mean, at the moment, we have a, a great deal, uh, well, there's considerable evidence for the prevention of ill-being. Uh, environmental stresses, pollution, noise, social stresses, crime, crowding, etc. It's no less important, of course, it's extremely important work, but it's not necessarily the determinants of positive mental health. So if we're going to get to this flourishing goal, that's, we, we, we've got to look at this in, e in almost an equal measure, perhaps. Um, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so for me at the moment, that there are certainly some, it's some, some really good evidence, uh, especially for nature-based solutions, and on the, this is on the promotion of, of well-being as, well, as opposed to prevention of ill-being. Um, active design as well, uh, these other topics, for me, it's really tentative uh, early research, but it's encouraging really, in really interesting stuff. Um, this was, I think, substantiated quite strongly this year by the What Works Wellbeing Centre's first study, uh, first publication, uh, which is quoted here. Okay, so treasure it, measure it, and it's good, use good measures. Uh, we also need uh, really credible research. We need, for me, that's, that's learning to dance and embrace complexity, because um, as uh, Johannes says, I think really eloquently, uh, Johannes, he, he's a quantum physicist who's defected over to well-being, and he says, uh, basically, yeah, well-being is, is more complex than quantum physics, and the question is twice as interesting. Um, and for me, it's precisely because of that complexity that we need to, uh, you know, we need to really be really careful and really um, systematic about how we, 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 we've learned to dance with that and learned to understand it. So, so just by way of example, one, one second, sorry. By, by way of example, uh, this is a study we published at the end of last year with cl uh, collaborators in Manchester and in Belfast. Um, and so what we did, we, we, did, we, took, we did a review of what are held up as the, uh, currently the gold standard um, intervention causal studies for urban design um, on uh, general population physical health levels, uh, levels of act physical activity. Uh, and we, we took what's called the, uh, the Cochrane Risk of Bias Tool. So for those of you who've not heard of Cochrane before, the Cochrane Standards is it, that, well, it's an independent group um, and a, uh, a very highly systematic and highly regarded uh, group of uh, scientists. And they, 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 we took one of their standards and we applied it to these best studies. Um, and it was all kinds of studies, things looking at cycle lanes, um, uh, skate parks, skateboard parks, uh, uh, trail, nature trails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we found was, 80% of the best causal studies were, were critically biased according to this to this um, to this standard, uh, and the other 20% were seriously biased. So, as you can imagine, it's, it's ruffled a few feathers, um, and uh, we we basically uh, we're really pleased that it's prompted a healthy debate, um, a healthy and respectful debate so far um, about. Are the Cochrane standards too high for the built environment? Um, and we're, basically, we're on the side that's saying most of them know that we need to strive for that. We haven't, in, in times we have achieved them, but we need to keep pushing. Um, and so, uh, going back to um, that list before, for me, that certainly there are some really great studies, as Colin was saying earlier, um, especially for nature. So this is, just, I've got two examples here. Um, the first one being, a meta-analysis of, of RCTs, randomised control trials, um, published um, last year, and it showed yet yeah, moderate increases for positive effects, which is really interesting, um, and not a smaller uh, decrease for, for negative or negative uh, effects or negative emotions. Um, and so, yeah, so a really good study. This, the other one that I, uh, this, uh, again, want to highlight, it's really, really strong, 17-year uh, longitudinal study using British household panel data here in the UK. Uh, and these, these life, life satisfaction was an okay measure of, of well-being, but um, nonetheless, it was a very strong association with proximity to green space. And because it was a panel study, they were able to compare to other major life events of the people in that time. And it was it, the equivalent of one third of the impact of, of uh, being married, um, which is good. Um, it's, it's shown to be correlate with well-being consistently, uh, or one tenth of that being employed. We, we know employment is really a big driver for well-being. So, so clearly, green greenery is one facet of the built environment is shown already to be increasingly important. So, we need 
we know that's that's great, that's brilliant, um, and I, um, we need to get past uh, that now to understand unlocking these these more specific pathways and these these mechanisms because constantly we, I, I work um, with developers and policymakers and they want to know the types, the quantities, the qualities of green space. They, you know, we got to give them more specifics about what, well, especially things that they can afford. Um, so these, this is um, just a, a mapping, if you like, of the various potential pathways uh, that are kind of uh, being heralded as the strongest possible like links if you're through to, to health and well-being, really. Um, and so just really quickly, I'm going to talk about one of my own studies, empirical study, and it's just to uh, hopefully clarify, we were looking at quality, improvement in quality, and specifically at in, um, physical activity, social contacts, and um, take notice, cognitions, uh, mindfulness. And so this was definitely the highlight of my PhD. Um, it was a community-led experiment in the, in the northern quarter in Manchester, and basically we took what was a rundown nowhere space in the heart of a neighborhood, and the local school, guerrilla gardeners, all sorts of local people um, got involved, and it was, it was a bit of a citizen science, citizen science project as well, so they learned a lot about the scientific process, etc. but basically we managed to, managed to raise 15,000 pounds to transform this space, and we saw significant improvements. It was before and after, it was a natural experiment. So before and after the study, uh, especially large increases for people taking notice, um, people connecting in the space. Physical activity, but only very small. It was a few toddlers, basically. We put some, a new lawn in, and mums had let their toddlers play, but that was only you know, a really small increase. Um, nonetheless, good. Um, OK, so. I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about this one, but just to wrap up and say, okay, that, those previous slides were more about what is well, well, high well-being and what, what is the creation of good uh, evidence around that uh, for the built environment. Um, we, we, do, we, we really need to uh, translate that, um, uh, especially the strong stuff, into, into effective practice. Um, so for me, I, I, unfortunately, I can't... Uh, due to reasons of confidentiality. I can't say too much, but just really quickly, um, uh, we've had two or three opportunities. I work for Bureau Hapold three days a week, and um, I've had a couple of opportunities to, to try out two approaches. There's a regulatory and a voluntary approach. So the regulatory is especially about HIA, health impact assessment. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's only a few local authorities in the UK who are championing that, but we've been lucky enough to work with one. Um, this is for what's called the factory in Manchester. Um, then the other one is that what I call voluntary approach. So this is where Lendley, so a developer, took the initiative and commissioned a, in this case, a public well well-being strategy. Um, and yeah, so, so the key the key thing here is that it, we, we we really we'd be trying to push uh, away from that the equivalent of greenwash in the 1990s and uh, you know push for, for, for uh, avoid this well wash situation. Uh, and really try to um, talk about constructively about gradation of evidence and making sure that the, the, the best stuff, especially the na nature-based solutions, evidence is being used. Um, and it's, it's about closing that gap because it's sometimes it's a 10, 15 year lag before from, from when people think the good stuff is published and when it's actually implemented, it's actually used. Um, so just to wrap up, 51% um, flourishing by 2050. Sorry, I think I missed that out earlier. Um, that's one of the manifestos from positive psychology, um, the idea is to, uh, to aim for 51% of all populations flourishing by 2050. Only really the Danish are anywhere near that, something like 40% estimation at the moment. In the, here in the UK, it's about 20%. Um, uh, that's, that's the holy grail. Low carbon, cost effective, um, high flourishing, um, high well-being. Um, we know it's associated with multiple benefits. Um, but to get there, we really need to avoid uh, this candy floss. We need more steak and parsnips, as it were, um, something better to chew on. Um, uh, for, you know, to, to really nurture this, this healthy knowledge ecosystem. So if we treasure it, measure it, we've got to dance through that complexity. Um, and then in terms of the implementation of science, um, we really do need to avoid uh, well wash and champion the best evidence. Um, so that's it, yeah. Thank you.